All right. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join us this morning for our webinar focused on school closures and special education. I'm Jen Blake, the Executive Director for Special Ed. I'm Naku Pogue. I'm the High School Coordinator for Special Education. I'm Allie Guilfoyle, an Elementary Coordinator for Networks 2 and 3. Terry Kaufman. I am the Coordinator of Special Education for the Middle School Network as well as uh, Elementary Network 4. We'll take a couple of moments just to go through our agenda and the content that we'll cover today, and then we will begin our presentation. Uh, so the um, focus for today is going to be on a couple of different points that are specific to special education. Um, the first is to focus on compliance as it pertains to special ed during the time of COVID-19 closures and we'll give a sense of the guidance we've received from local, state, and federal authorities so far regarding our obligations as it pertains to individual education programs. From there, we will touch on service delivery guidance and the roles and responsibilities for our staff based on the discipline of special education providers. Then we'll move into a section just focused on some of the unknowns. Um, as many of you may be aware, the guidance regarding special education is constantly evolving and there are some things on which we are awaiting responses from the authorities at a variety of levels. And so we'll touch on what uh, we know currently in our best thinking and then some of the areas where there may still be some lingering questions that are under further review. Our last section will be focused specifically on support that is available from our central special education team, what our team is working on, and how we can support you in your service to students and families during this difficult time. And then we want to reserve about half of our time today for questions and answers from you all to make sure that you have the information that you need to properly support and serve students with disabilities during our distance learning. So first up is IEP guidance specifically around compliance. And um, I wanted to take a moment to just highlight a couple of overview points before we dive into some more specifics relative to special education compliance. The first thing to note is that IEPs are governed by federal law and special education is heavily focused on federal guidance as a result. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act is the primary law that governs special education across all states. And from there, states may issue additional guidance or administrative regulations that are specific to their state above and beyond the provisions of IDEA. Because of that, much of what we will present today relative to IEP guidance is an evolving area under review um, at the federal and at the state level. We do expect that there will be some updates that are quite timely within the next week or so relative to this, and Carrie will touch more on that later in the presentation. The second part is to note that there have only been two highly specific waivers of timelines as they pertain to IEP compliance so far. And we will address exactly what those two are and some recommended guidance for other areas um, that don't have specific guidance from California Department of Education. And then finally, as a result of that, all other timelines and compliance requirements as we speak today are still in effect. We wanted to touch base really quickly on AB 117, um, which was a state law uh, that addressed COVID-19 broadly as it pertains to multiple areas of education, not just special education. Uh, the part of the law that is specific to special education are those two waivers that I just mentioned. The state has control over some pieces of IEP compliance that are not specifically addressed in IDEA, the federal law. And those are the five-day response timeline for requests for records and the 15-day response timeline for responding to any new requests for a special education evaluation. So at this time, the legislature has determined that we should consider this period of COVID closure as a told break, similarly to the way that special educators may take a break from responding to evaluations or records requests during spring break or winter holiday or other breaks that are typically in excess of five days. So those are two areas where right now we're able to hit pause, with the understanding being that we still need to acknowledge the request from the family or agency, and we need to follow up in a timely manner once schools resume in-person session. The next section are our ongoing responsibilities. 
So right now we do have all other responsibilities to special education provisions intact until such time as we get any changes from the federal level. With that said, we still have 30 days to convene an IEP when a parent or guardian requests one. We still need to be holding annual and triennial IEPs to the maximum extent possible. We're still responsible for providing services to families, and we are still responsible for preparing and sending progress on goals at the same time as general education students receive feedback or report cards. Some new guidance regarding IEPs as it pertains to the change in services under COVID is on this slide. CDE has advised school districts that we should not be holding IEP amendments to document modifications to service delivery that we are only proposing because schools are closed for in-person learning. If an, IEP isn't, if an IEP team rather is not proposing the change to be long-term based on the students changing needs, then CDE's advice is that this actually is not under the purview of the IEP team. Right now, as we know, the vast majority of all students across the United States are being impacted by the COVID closures and are unable to attend schools in person, meaning that IEPs are impossible to implement as written until such time as we resume an in-person session. Of course, nothing in this guidance is, in, is determined to allow IEP teams to not convene if a parent has questions or concerns. And if a parent reaches out and requests an IEP team meeting, we would still wanna get that team together within 30 calendar days to address any concerns or questions that the parent or guardian has. This is a very wordy slide, and so I won't go into every detail, but there have been a lot of questions that have been raised about privacy as it pertains to moving to online services, particularly if we're providing services in a group format. So there are a couple of things to note on here that you can review um, after the webinar relative to the specifics, but what I wanted to highlight here is that when used appropriately, many of our online learning tools are appropriate for special education and can be FERPA compliant. And Zoom actually can be HIPAA compliant as well, again, when utilized appropriately. You may have seen in the news recently that there have been some breaches relative to student data that are possible when we do things like put publicly passwords or links to Zoom Hangouts or other types of learning scenarios. And so to the extent possible, it's very important for you to be keeping secure the, in the information about accessing any of the Zoom, Google Hangouts, Cisco WebEx, or other platforms that you may be using to connect directly with students and families. The other thing to keep in mind is that it's really important to go through the guidelines for virtual services with your parents and guardians prior to starting those services whenever possible. Um, video recording, screen grabbing, and other types of information should not be allowed by parents as they can compromise the individuality of other students if you're providing group services. And then we would ask that you follow similar things to what you would do during the regular instructional year when you're meeting with a group. For example, using only first names, um, you know, keeping the student alone in the room to the extent that is possible based on their disability impact. And then specific to our therapeutic services, we would want to make sure that the student is providing consent for anyone else to be in the room with them when a session is happening if it's being conducted via video. The next section has several slides around guidance just for holding IEPs. And I wanted to also mention now that all of this guidance is included in our OUSD Special Education Distance Learning Guidance document, which we have linked into the slides today and have put forth to everyone um, working within special ed. Um, and we have an if-then one-pager that we also are sharing with folks to go through some of the more nuanced situations that may occur relative to IEPs. So the first thing to note is that we really recommend that you send an agenda in advance that has norms for virtual meetings. As many of you have probably experienced over the course of the last few weeks, unless you set forth guidelines around Zoom, it can be difficult sometimes for teams to meet in a way that's efficient and allows for everybody to understand what's happening. We also recommend that any district members join the Zoom a few minutes in advance just to test any issues regarding access, make sure everyone can hear everyone and the like. You can use the chat feature of online meetings or a Q&A to make sure that questions that are off topic are recorded, similarly to the way that you might use a parking lot during an in-person IEP meeting. And you can share your screen with a soft copy of the IEP if it's not possible for you to send that draft to the family in advance. 
Parents do have the right to refuse to attend an IEP right now. And many families are probably feeling very overwhelmed. And frankly, an IEP may be the last thing on their mind. And that is okay. What we're asking is simply that we record opportunities to connect with families around IEPs, make sure those are documented in the comment feature of SACE. And in addition to that, if possible, we would like for parents and guardians to put in writing that they do not want to meet for an IEP until such time as the team is able to convene in person. A text or an email uploaded to SACE is perfectly fine for this purpose. And if a family says verbally to you, I don't want to meet right now, it's too much for me to coordinate, and they don't put it in writing, that's totally fine. The last thing we want to do is be stressing out families by trying to force them to you know, put things into writing. You would just want to document the date and time on which that call happened, and then we have information to be able to give to the California Department of Education regarding why that IEP isn't taking place within timeline. The other note here is that parents do retain the right to a full IEP team. So we can't be excusing um, LEA representatives, um, you know, that could be an admin or a designee. Um, we can't be excusing general education teachers um, just because we are in a school closure situation. If there is a circumstance that requires a team member be excused, like an illness or other unforeseen issue, of course you can still utilize the excusal form and please send that out in advance to the maximum extent possible so that the parent has the information in advance of who will and will not be present. If a parent doesn't have printing and scanning for the purposes of consent, they can give you an email or a text message documenting their consent. They can also give you verbal consent if no written option is available to them, and you can document that in the notes. I did want to name here that many people have reached out relative to electronic or virtual signature options, and the district is exploring adopting a larger version of such options for the purposes of signing a variety of documents, not just in special education. In the meantime, through OUSD Gmail, you should have access to DocuSign for one person to sign a document if you wanted to start using that. Otherwise, you're welcome to just type the names of all of the district providers into the consent page and then send to the parent. If they're able to sign or scan or use DocuSign, great. If not, you can have them just document their consent in any way that is available to them. And the last section here is around guidance pertaining to evaluations. And this, of course, is a very tricky, tricky topic for people because we know a lot of folks have initials and triennials that they were working on at the time we shut down schools. There are some pieces of evaluations that can be done, and we are advising our staff to please do as many pieces of evaluations as you can. If you have a signed assessment plan, you can get started with rating scales, you can do interviews with students and parents, you can begin reviewing records and other district data. There are other portions, of course, that require physical administration. And it's really important that we follow the guidelines and the directions for administration for any standardized normed reference test to make sure that we can interpret the findings with fidelity. It's also really important that we observe students within their educational setting to determine their continued need for special education. And so to that end, we will not be able to complete many of the initials and triennials that are coming up. Uh, we are still awaiting guidance regarding if any evaluation timelines will be waived or forgiven. As it stands today, there have been no such waivers, but there may be in coming weeks. And of course, as guidance changed, we will make sure to keep you guys updated as quickly as possible. So our key takeaway relative to compliance for all of you is really the following. Just do your best. We know that this is not business as usual. We know that there will be IEPs that cannot happen for a variety of factors or cannot be completed for a variety of factors. But to the extent that you're able, please make sure that you're engaging with your family so that they know that you're still there and that we as a district are taking the IEP process seriously, even during this really, really difficult time. Okay, thanks, Jen. And um, now we'll talk a little bit about services and staff roles. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide. Great, thanks. Um, so as Jen just mentioned, uh, an overall message um, around services as well is that we're asking folks to do their best. Um, given the school closure and our overall um, reduction of work hours and learning hours, we know that it's not possible to provide services in the way that we normally do when school is in, se in, se in session. Um, but we are going to continue to do the, our best to implement students' IEPs to the extent that is possible. Um, to do so, we're going to be prioritizing, or we are already, um, 
student, student and family check-ins. We're keeping the whole child in mind. Um, we're also planning learning activities for students to engage in from home so that their skills can be maintained and or advanced um, during the school closure and um, remind folks to, to be um, in collaboration with, in coordination with teams to ensure um, sort of co the coherence and that um, the balance of all services is manageable for students who have multiple services and providers. Um, so first speaking to the role specifically of the special educators, special education teachers. As special educators, our, our two main buckets um, are maintained in this setting. So we know that a big part of our work has to do with teaching, instructional time, and another big part of our work has to do with um, case management um, responsibilities. So in alignment with the OEA MOU with the district, um, we are asking that special educators um, continue to um, plan and deliver instructional activities to students in various ways um, and also um, connect with students and families individually on a weekly basis. We have a more specific guidance around what this should look like for different roles and different programs um, in our special education distance learning guidance doc. Um, but this looks like a 10 minute phone call or a 15 minute phone call anywhere from one to three times a week. Uh, sorry, just if you can go back really quickly. I just, I just wanted to mention that SAI um, is the service that's most often provided by our special education teachers, and it's also the one that is most impacted at this time during the closure, because students might have hours of SAI time weekly or even daily in their IEP. For example, a student um, in, a, in a special day class setting might have uh, like six hours a day of SAI, and that's something that we obviously are not able to um, provide in this setting. Um, and so instead, as mentioned, our focus is on consultative phone calls and check-ins with families and students about the learning, the learning opportunities that we are able to plan for them. Related service providers, um, the, the role of speech language pathologists might be the one that kind of most, in a most straightforward way, um, like aligns to or overlaps or is possible, I guess, in this, in this type of setting. Um, our speech language pathologists have been um, provided guidance to both consult with families and also provide some level of direct service depending on age of the student. Um, and so in some cases, speech, speech language pathologists are, are going to be able to actually conduct um, individual or small group services with their students. All other service providers like occupational therapists and physical therapists and um, deaf and hard of hearing teachers are focusing mostly on providing consultative services to families. Um, we're also recommending that these providers, when possible, create lessons or um, activities for, for families to engage in at home. And um, we're hoping to, to set up a special education YouTube channel on which to stream these um, different activities. And then just a reminder that all IEP team members are expected to prepare for and participate in IEP meetings, update progress toward goals, um, and so on. Um, a lot of folks have been asking about the role of support staff in, during the closure. And it's a really good question. As we know, our, our paraeducators and ISSs are really critical members of our school and classroom communities um, in when school is in session. Uh, and they continue to, um, to be important members of our teams during the closure. I just wanted to note that this time, the most recent MOU that the district has um, with the labor unions um, indicates that paras and ISSs should be continuing to support the continuity of education plans that are in place across the district. However, I think it is important for us to note and consider that there might be some obstacles. Um, support staff, for example, are not generally issued OUSD technology. And so um, it is in the works that once all students in need are distributed technology that support staff in need will also be provided district technology. And in the meantime, support staff are generously when possible using their personal technology and internet to support distance learning activities. Um, and also wanted to note that just like when we're in the school building and school is in session, we should not be expecting or assigning support staff to be working like um, individual, like alone with students outside of the direction of a credentialed teacher. 
they certainly can be pushing into Zoom calls um, that, and, and lessons and classes that teachers are holding. They can support breakout groups. However, they should not be assigned to make individual phone or video calls on their own. Um, and then we do have, in addition, I mean, in this time we are taking responsibility. Oops, there's a little feedback. Um, in this time, we all, uh, we all are taking responsibility for checking in on student wellness um, and family wellness and health. Um, however, we do have some folks who, are, who hold a primary, um, who, for whom that is their primary um, responsibility during the school year. Um, and those folks are continuing to check in with students and families at this time. So students who do have educationally related mental health services should have continued offers of service and support throughout the closure from their providers. Um, our non-public agency partners like Seneca and EBAC and Lincoln, et cetera, um, are reaching out to families, doing check-ins, doing therapy, teletherapy. Um, and they're also providing um, support to families with delivering food, diapers, supplies um, that are needed. Our RBTs and licensed vocational nurses who work with students individually, um, often in classroom settings, um, are also checking in daily um, with families to support the development and implementation of at-home behavior or health plans for students. Our OUSD social workers and school psychologists um, also are continuing to provide individual and or group mental health services and checking in with students on their caseloads. Um, and as mentioned, some students are, are actually engaging in um, individual or group teletherapy. Um, in other cases, families are engaging in parent counseling or other consultation, and that depends on both student need and IEP services and also family preferences at this time. And just a note that all of us providing services should continue tracking services just as we do during the regular school year. Um, teachers and providers can track their services and their attempts at services in the master distance learning tracking document that was shared at the start of the closure. Um, and we should all be continuing to make attempts in good faith to reach students and families. However, we know that we're not going to be able to reach everyone at this time for various reasons. And so if after multiple attempts you've not been able to make contact with a student or family, um, you can reach out with a letter and we'll be providing a template from our department to support with that. Thank you, Ali. Uh, we're going to switch over to areas under further review, which to me is uh, the stuff where we're not yet clear about based on state or federal guidance. So we're waiting for some clarity on that. Um, when we start this conversation, the first thing we look at is the CARES Act, which was the uh, stimulus bill uh, for coronavirus. Um, in that bill, it talked about allowing uh, the Secretary of Education to make recommendations for waivers. Um, there's also um, the National Association of Schools Directors of Special Ed have, um, as well as many other organizations, have written to Congress and written to the Secretary of Education at the federal and the state level asking for different specific waivers to be granted around IEP compliance. Um, because like Jen said, the only waivers we currently have are around 15 days for new assessments and five days for requests for records. So all other timelines are in effect as of now. Um, so that's the, the, the bottom of that is kind of the, the law written in. Um, into the, the CARES Act, and I'm not going to read it, but um, um, you will be able to read it when you get access to this. The implications further, um, but, uh, the Secretary of Education does have 30 days from the signage of the, of the act, which was March 27th, to make those recommendations for waivers, and there is an expectation, and without them, we're, we really are, we don't have guidance on what to do when we can't conduct an assessment because children are at home. Um, so we're really hoping for some clarity at the federal and state level around um, IEP compliance, um, at least uh, the procedural stuff. When we, um, next slide. When we look at um, our district, um, we have Diagnostic Center that does our preschool evaluations. We also have current evaluations that are in session. Uh, that are in progress. Like I said, there is no clear waiver of the 60-day timeline for assessments. However, 
if we have not conduct completed the assessment, it requires in-person testing, then we, we have advised that we cannot complete uh, the assessment until in-person sessions continue. Um, we can reflect on what has been completed to determine if our testing is enough to determine eligibility and move forward with an IEP or not. And like uh, Jen said, we are developing an if then one pager that is very focused around um, holding IEPs when, when it would be appropriate to hold it or when we should wait until um, schools uh, open up back in session uh, in person. Um, because there are no waivers. Uh, there's also no waivers for kids turning three as of now, which is a preschool um, specific uh, issue. Uh, all those assessments require in-person testing and we have to assess and determine eligibility for a child on or before their third birthday. So there's an ongoing stream of students that we're supposed to be testing and there is no clear waiver um, for that as of now. There is also um, no clear guidance from the state or the federal level on what specifically distance learning should look like. We've uh, heard from the state, we've been to webinars about what other districts are doing successfully and what um, we've talked to multiple different districts about this, but there isn't a clear um, guidance from the federal or state government on that. Um, there is no, there's a recommendation against amending IEPs uh, because this is not um, a change that we're proposing. It's a health emergency that's requiring this. However, there might need to be an amendment to discuss the appropriateness of distance learning for students with unique needs. Um, there is going to be an overall of overall decrease of services for almost every student. So it's not clear how we're going to rectify that. OSEP, which is the Office of Special Education Programs uh, federally, uh, re they release letters um, that are actually usually legally binding letters that they released and they released a letter uh, discussing what compensatory education would look like in this in this uh, time of closures and the way that they were uh, trying to um, envision what compensatory education would look like is more around how we examine extended school year so typical compensatory education would be if we miss services we have to provide it you know, have to make it up but the Office of Special Education Programs felt like once school comes back in session, we would want to collect data to see um, if a student significantly reg regressed over the significant closure. And if there was significant regression, we might want to look at providing them um, extra services in order to get them to where they were or to um, provide them uh, support in order to, to decrease their regression. All right, um, here's the types of supports that our department are offering. So we have several resources and materials available. Um, there's a special education distance learning guide. Um, some highlights from that guide are, there's details about IEP compliance guidance. Um, it, um, it, it spells out the case manager roles that Allie was referring to earlier. Um, and the related service roles. There's also distance learning resources for teachers and families on that guide. Um, the special edu education website is also available. There are more general education res resources and activities and tips for families. Um, and there's also the Q&A. We update that regularly. The questions and answers, some of the questions and answers from today's session will be updated on that Q&A and there'll be weekly updates on the special education website as well. Additionally, um, AT and AAC have really awesome online trainings for educators and families. Some highlights from those trainings are um, a Google Meets Hangouts drop-in support. So any questions you have, I saw a question on there earlier um, about helping a para be supported with how to use Zoom. They, they also have tips for zoom um, so there's and then they have just office hours sort of to drop in there are great resource resources for routines for families at home um, and they also have a webinar on google read and write these are um, these are also some of them are recorded because they've done them previously some of them are live and then they have the drop-in options there coming up in may we will be able to provide um, 
hard copies of our resources to in our educational program to moderate and moderate severe classrooms um, in bulk. So that's really exciting as well. Oops. My apologies. <laughs> on the link instead of the slide here. <laughs> Our, instru our instructional coaches are also available to support. They have been really, they like hit the ground running with putting resources together to support teachers. Um, they're continuing their individual supports and meetings. Um, there's monthly PLCs that they've been continuing that have been organized by um, programs. So there's one for inclusion, there's one for mild mod, moderate severe and mental health. Um, and then they are also providing, they can also provide or support with site-based trainings, just reach out to them. Um, some of our coaches have put together a really um, simple, easy go-to COVID-19 compliance procedures guide. Some of the questions that I saw in the Q&A um, are really easily answered there. It's like an if-then sort of situation. If, you know, there's no testing, what, how do I proceed in a try? Um, and then they have set up Google Classrooms. There's an elementary mod sev Google Classroom, a middle school Google Classroom coming soon, and a high school special education Google Classroom with resources that have sample weekly um, schedules, um, lesson plans, and just tips for families and teachers. Um, guidance from special education leadership. So we continue to manage and maintain these guidance docs I just discussed, our special education website. Um, we are available to consult with district and site administrators. Um, we um, help maintain the Teacher Central and Google Classroom creation and maintenance. Um, and then uh, we also collaborate with and gather information and resources from other districts and SELPAs in the Bay Area and California. Um, we, the SELPAs have been really active in supporting each other with what to do during this time and how to interpret um, direction coming from the state, from the federal. Um, and so we've been really, really coming together to support each other. Um, there's also communication coming soon um, to families with a robocall and letters that are in multiple languages next week. And then uh, we will be doing weekly email blasts to teachers and administrators from our special education email address. Um, addition, so just a little bit more details about the direct communication to families. Our, we're asking our teachers based on the program that they teach to um, directly consult with families. So resource students, it's 15 minutes a week per family or per student. Um, mild, moderate, and counseling enriched SDC students are supposed to receive two 15 minute phone calls or Zoom meetings, um, just consulting. And then moderate and moderate severe SDC students is three 10 minute um, sessions a week. And then, um, the, like I mentioned, the robocall coming up. And then, and this will really be directing our families towards our website and resources there and any other district resources that are available. And for, for family requests, this one is really important, in which the response is not obvious or known, please follow up immediately with the instructional coach or the appropriate coordinator so that we can respond in a timely fashion as legally required. Um, for example, if, if someone asks in an IEP meeting or emails an administrator and says, can, some, can the nurse come to my house to provide services for my child? We need to know that the family has asked that question so we can respond appropriately. Um, if somebody asks, can, you know, what, what's going to happen? Can I get makeup services? Can I get comp services? Can I get makeup services for all this time my student is missing, my child is missing? So those are questions we need to know are being asked and so that we can respond quickly. And we have a poll. Um, we, we're really curious what other resources you would like from us during this time. So I think Kellef is gonna post the poll and um, please feel free to answer. Um, compliance and IEP case management, instructional materials and resources, utilizing district adopted platforms, and family and student outreach. What more support could you use from us? 
Okay, and uh, while we're doing that, I wanted to take a moment to introduce uh, another panelist that has joined us. Um, Anne Zarnawicki is our coordinator for related services um, and is here for the last portion of our agenda to ensure that any questions regarding our related services teams, our speech pathologists, occupational therapists, adaptive PE specialists, and the like, are addressed by the person who knows and works with them best. Um, so at this time, um, I know we have some questions that have been um, typed into the Q&A um, and um, we can go through a couple of those and um, provide responses in addition to the written responses that are coming in. And then um, we will also have time for um, any specific questions not already typed in from um, participants. And so I do see a couple of questions here that I wanted to um, just get started with um, regarding um, extended school year, because I know that is on a lot of folks' minds. Um, right now, we are planning as though extended school year will be in person. Um, and we have begun the logistical work of that in terms of uh, assigning students to caseloads, um, beginning to look at our staff applicants, and finalizing bus routing. We are, however, uh, planning for a potential need to pivot to a virtual learning model. And that is really contingent upon the guidance that we receive from local and state health authorities and the governor's office regarding the potential continuation of any shelter in place um, or other health regulations that would prevent us from meeting in person. We are prepared to make a final decision regarding extended school year by no later than the first week of May so that our families and staff have an opportunity to plan in advance for what that means come June. There are multiple questions about the slide deck. We will obviously make sure we get it to you guys in some form or fashion that is uh, viewable so you can use the links as well as other things uh, that are in the slide deck or distribute it to, to your support staff, stuff like that. Um, there's a question about DocuSign, and um, mm -hmm. if you download a PDF from our OUSD account, you should be able to open it with DocuSign. Um, one signature is free, and our accounts currently provide a few multiple s signatures for free as well. There's also DocHub, which is one of the Google add-ons that also has some access to free signatures. Um, should I hold an IEP triennial meeting if the okay. psych report is not ready? Um, this depends on whether the eligibility yes. is an area of question or uncertainty. Yes. So we have specific guidance in the distance learning plan, but there is no question, if there is no question about eligibility, it can likely be held with the review of records only. For others, we recommend holding a part one to share the information. Um, you do have to let the family know we will need to reconvene in the in the future. All right. Question uh, about our oops, sorry, Jen. Just quickly, our website. Um, you can find our website at ousd.org/specialeducation. You can also find it by going to the OUSD website, ousd.org, um, and going and searching under departments, special education. We've had a number of questions around uh, further clarification about the roles of support staff, our paraeducators and instructional support specialists. Um, if you have worked with your support staff to assign them functions such as providing check-ins via phone with students um, or families, that's totally fine. Um, providing wellness checks, just maintaining ongoing communication, um, making sure that the student has access to instructional materials, those types of checks are completely appropriate for school staff to, support staff to be engaging in. Um, what we would ask that you refrain from asking support staff to do is providing any direct academic instruction uh, with students without the, um, the guidance and direction of a teacher. Um, and so some roles that are totally acceptable would be having a para or ISS do push-in services into a Zoom classroom with a general education teacher, um, or perhaps using a breakout room within Zoom to work with a small group of students while the gen ed teacher is providing that guidance around the particular lesson or topic. It's also perfectly fine for your para or ISS to join you in providing services. Um, we would just ask that you don't direct them to um, completely on their own um, be setting up any type of video um, consultation with families around specialized academic instruction or providing those direct services to students solo. Mm -hmm. Did you text her? Yeah. 
Does it seem likely that we'll be required to report progress on IEP goals for the third trimester? Um, so given that report cards are comment only, um, so legally progress on goals is required for all students whenever gen ed students receive their report cards. So um, we're, we're, we're working on a sample of what this can look like without access to students over the last months of school. So look for that in, um, in our guidance documents. There have been a couple of questions I saw around counseling. Um, families should know who they're getting counseling from if they're getting ongoing counseling. So you can check in with families if, if it's in their IEP through Education and Mental Health Services. Um, you can ask if it's happening. If it isn't happening, um, we can work to resolve that. There's multiple ways we can work that. You can let your instructional coach know, um, and then we can contact the appropriate uh, people for that. So there's a question about um, how can you find out which agency is providing ERMS outpatient counseling to students? Um, the, those, that information should be, should be determined at the IEP meeting. Um, so the case manager should have that information. If you have questions um, as a teacher, feel free to reach out to a coach. Um, and RS, our RS is responsible for making sure the agencies are connecting. Um, it, RSs are responsible for uh, checking in to, to see if those services are happening, if they have contact with families. Uh, there's a question about tracking services. Um, can we use the document used to track our work through OUSD that was provided through OUSD? Seems like a duplication of work. So um, you can use any tracker that can be easily shared with our staff via an online method. Um, please don't use paper trackers or notes um, to avoid having to scan and send. Please do not track student service in a document that is shared widely with folks outside of the IEP team. And the important pieces of the document are, you know, how the, the time, the date, and whether the service was provided or not. There is a question, um, I think folks are wondering about their students who, who are going to be in transition um, after at the end of the school year. So the question about a fifth grader who's in process um, of an assessment that, that won't be able to com be completed, it'll have to continue into sixth grade, and this is what will need to happen. We're, we're not going to be able to, to um, finish testing and determine eligibility at this time. Um, so that will carry over to sixth grade. Um, and the team there. This reminds me that our, to share with folks that our, our team is working on um, converting what was planned to be our April all sped teacher PD um, into a virtual and asynchronous format um, to support student transition. So you'll get more information about that next week on Wednesday um, about how we can support passing on information from fifth grade to sixth grade teams, preschool to kindergarten teams, eighth grade to ninth grade teams and so on. Um, how will classrooms be supported that currently aren't staffed across the district? Um, there are various ways um, that we are working as teams and problem solving to um, address those vacancies. Um, some of those have been um, that the, the paraprofessionals or the, the ISSs in the class um, have been working on just like as if there were no teacher present during that time move up um, to be able to um, provide some of those services in consult with um, our special education team or another special education teacher on site um, or that special education teacher um, if it is just like an absence for a few weeks or something like that. Compensatory education question, how are we to demonstrate that a child needs this year's ESY without actually seeing the child before next school year? If you have any data that you took, you can even look at grades before, um, before fall break, before winter break, and compare them to the results after and see if there are any, um, if there's data that supports that there was any regression there, you can use that information to determine ESY. 
And, and there's a couple more questions. Extended school year will be treated just like every other extended school year. It will not be uh, a service offered to make up services um, with very few exceptions. It is a service that is provided uh, because of regression and recoupment. Um, and that has not changed because of this closure. So it will not be blanketly offered to, to students. It will be offered to students that meet um, the criteria for extended school year. I see this. Does Zoom meeting with several students meet the 15 minute consult for each student? Yes. That's an easy one. There was a question around uh, if a parent or family requests individual time with a support staff or ISS, how to navigate or respond to that. Um, my recommendation would be to uh, explain to the family that we need to be aligning our supports based on the core roles and duties that are appropriate to each type of personnel. Um, and that every different type of job classification within Oakland Unified School District has specific core duties. Um, and while um, our support staff are obviously incredibly valuable resources, um, they are not expected during typical instruction to be providing um, instruction outside of the guidance and support of a certificated staff member. And so in a situation such as a school closure, we would want to make sure that we're not having them perform fu functions that we would not ask of them during regular instruction. And if, of course, there is a parent who continues to ask follow-up questions regarding, um, you know, that type of a situation, you're welcome to, um, you know, connect with your instructional coach or one of us um, to provide additional guidance and information to that family. Um, there's a question about what am I supposed to be doing with each family for 10 minutes three times a week? Is there a script? Um, you can look at the, the moderate severe um, Google Classrooms and we, we can post some, some support for those conversations um, in next week. Um, but generally it's gonna depend on each student. Um, it's really kind of you know it, engaging in su suggestions for how to engage students like um, you know, in, in activities that you're putting on your, you're suggesting in your Google Classroom at home. Um, we're not expecting parents to be teachers. Um, and then really just getting feedback from them. Um, what are their needs? Um, and, and how, and getting more information about how they can be supported. There's a question about supporting classrooms that aren't currently staffed that I don't think we've answered yet, right, team? I, I, I think I answered. Oh, did you? One. Okay, great. Never mind. Hmm. How do oh, just moved. How do SPED teachers navigate around gen ed teachers that refuse SPED students from engaging with their peers? Um, I'm going to interpret that um, in a couple different ways. So how do SPED teachers navigate around gen, gen ed teachers that are not engaging um, with their special education students? Um, that's definitely a, a conversation to have um, directly with the gen ed teacher and follow up with your administrator if, um, if you're seeing resistance there. Um, Refuse sped students from engaging with their peers. I'm not, maybe, maybe anonymous attendee can type that question again. I'm not understanding that second part there. There's a question about report card progress. I don't think we answered that. Um, we, as I think Jen said, the expectations around, around federal guidance of, of progress reports continues, but we are interpreting it as it's, you're supposed to do the same thing as general education. So if general education is moving to a comment only, then the expectation is that we would move to a comment only. There is a comment uh, section on all progress on goals. So instead of uh, collecting data around progress on a goal, which is very challenging or impossible depending on the goal during a, a closure, we would comment on it. And, the com and we, we will also possibly work towards a script if the comment, if, there is una if you're unable to get data around it, then we wanna make sure we have a clear comment around why um, obviously do the, uh, the closures. 
We had a question around grading and credit, no credit, I believe two, um, one was in the, the chat as well. Um, and this is a really um, a good question um, and, a, and a tricky one right now in um, the time in which we find ourselves. Um, for students with IEPs who are in secondary programs for the purposes of issuing credit, no credit, um, there is district guidance um, for all teachers, um, both Jen and Sped, Jeanette and Sped, around um, some interventions that must be attempted and exhausted prior to issuing no credit. And so obviously we would want all of our staff to be adhering to those guidelines. In addition to that, for students with IEPs, we would want to seriously consider the potential impact that a limitation of special ed services may have on the child's ability to complete work. Um, if a student was receiving a passing grade prior to the closures in March, um, we would want to make sure that that student continues to receive credit for their work moving forward. Um, and that is based on a couple of factors. One, as I mentioned, we cannot say we are implementing accommodations and services with fidelity in accordance with IEPs right now because of our physical inability to access children at this time. The second piece of that um, is that we still know we have students who have challenges and barriers related to accessing instruction. Um, we know that there are students who still have um, not received Chromebooks through the district adopted distribution system. We also know that there are some families that are struggling with internet access. Um, and so while we work on differentiating our approach, um, and there are some things that we're, we're pushing out um, to teams in terms of support there, things like um, you know, a limited ability to do paper-based packets for some students, providing YouTube videos, instructions, and, and other ways of, of working with students who don't have internet, we don't want to penalize a student on the basis of their lack of access. Um, and so the short answer to this question is that for the vast majority of students with IEPs, it's likely you will be issuing credit. The only circumstance under which we would consider not issuing credit would be if you've exhausted all of the district recommended interventions and the student was not passing and receiving all of their services prior to the school closure. And if you have specific questions about a student prior to issuing a no credit grade, we would highly recommend that you connect with your instructional coach and with your principal or assistant principal so that we can make sure that we're making that decision using all of the available information regarding that child's situation. Just wanted to jump in and um, discuss any upcoming trainings that pe people can attend. Um, related service providers are attempting to um, do some trainings that will help be helpful to staff. Um, if you look at the a ACAT team, there's quite a few trainings that are coming up um, and have been very exciting for, um, for staff, but also for families to attend. Um, something on um, using an AAC device at home. There's one on using Google Read and Write for PDFs. Um, so very exciting things that are happening. Please check that out. As well, someone asked about um, support from the APE teachers. The APE teachers are reaching out to, um, to families and they're also excited and ready to do uh, videos that families can, can use at home um, to have some physical activities that are safe for students with disabilities. If you have any further questions about trainings, um, by all means, you can email me and Zernowicki. There are some questions about the modality in which folks are connecting with families. I just want to reiterate and clarify um, that it is totally fine to be connecting with families via text or um, I think Class Dojo or some other uh, platforms came up as ways that, that folks are engaging with families. Um, the important thing is that we are connecting with families and making an effort to do so on a regular basis. Um, and, and so if that works best by um, text or other platform, that is totally fine. The follow up to that is if we can't reach the families, we are developing or we, it might already have been developed uh, a log of the attempts that we have made as well as a letter because we really do want to make an effort. We know some families will be very hard to reach or impossible to reach at this time, um, but we do want to make sure we're making every effort and we will track, um, the teachers will be able to track that um, if they're unable to reach families. So we have documentation around that. Um, there were, I saw a few questions around students who are sad and are having a difficult time not being at school. I did want to plug another resource. The psychologist put together a great resource of social, social emotional supports um, for families as well as for teachers to support with their students with. And um, that is 
located in our distance learning document under the resources section. There's also some questions here about placement for next year. Um, uh, should we tell those parents who want to request to change it? Just yes, please just follow, have them follow, submit the appeal form. Um, the deadline for appeal forms is the 20th of April, which is Monday, I believe. Yes. So um, please just feel, feel free to have them submit the appeal form and folks will follow up. Uh, following that as well, there's been a couple of questions around the transitioning and access to teachers due to the uh, closure, the stress it's causing on everyone, uh, um, and the limited amount of time our teachers have. We cannot um, mandate our teachers who are getting new students to be available to speak to families at this time. And we are definitely, we definitely hear that as a concern and we want to make sure that families feel comfortable going into the new school and program. But at this time, um, we are unable to uh, resolve that or set anything up to allow for families to communicate with uh, teachers for next, for next year. There's a question specifically around seniors. Look for um, documentation on the high school Google Classroom around um, some what to do with seniors who are graduating or close to graduating. And I just wanted to speak briefly to the comment around focusing on mental and physical health and well-being. Um, yes, I think that's what our families should be doing. Um, I think that that is human and very appropriate and important, and in some cases probably more important than anything else that we can offer them, is to just be available to listen and to be present with them and to understand that this is a tremendous challenge for everyone. Um, you know, many of us are parents, and um, you know, although I am not the parent of a child with special needs, um, on the days that you know I've had Gray with me, I know getting work done is um, difficult to impossible. Um, and so, to that end, if there are other resources that we can um, provide, we are happy to partner. Many of our school psychologists are willing and able to provide check-ins with families directly. Um, and so if you are having a situation where you are concerned about a student or concerned about a family, um, you've talked to them and you've heard that they are experiencing significant stress, um, you're worried about their ongoing physical or mental health, um, please connect with us. And in addition to directing you to other district resources that can follow up with that family, we can also make sure that um, our personnel are being directed to engage with those students and families who are experiencing um, either anxiety or significant stress as a result of this time. We do have a number of questions um, remaining and not much time. Um, so I just want to perhaps kind of start closing up um, by reminding folks to check out our special education distance learning guidance document, um, which is available through the, the, the master kind of um, COVID doc that went out from Sandra, also um, has been shared with you in other ways. And if you are having trouble finding it, you can email one of us to let us know and we can get that in your hands. That's gonna be the good place to be coming back to on a regular basis. We'll keep it updated as much as possible um, and include the questions and answers from today's event there as well. Any of the questions that we have not been able to address uh, virtually, um, as Ali mentioned, we will make sure that we provide written responses to all of those. In addition to the um, special education distance learning document, we are trying to have a universal design approach um, relative to communicating at this time. Um, so starting next week, every week until the close of school year, um, I will also be putting out a um, video message to all of our special education personnel that highlights some of the key things that have been coming up, either changes in guidance or new resources and tools that we're making. Um, so please be on the lookout for that on Monday and then every Monday um, subsequently until the close of May. Um, we really want to thank you all again for your um, participation in today's webinar. Um, please be on the lookout for those Q&As that will be uploaded by the end of the day today with anything that we didn't have time to address. 
Thank you, Kellis, for all of the tremendous work behind the scenes arranging all of these webinars so that folks can engage with one another even though we can't be with each other in person. And uh, most of all, thank you to all of our site leaders, service providers, um, my coordinators and instructional coaches um, for really with grace um, and lots and lots of effort and hard work pivoting to supporting in a very, very different way um, under very challenging circumstances. So we are very thankful for all of you and your support of our kids here in Oakland. All right, thank you everyone. We are at 12 o'clock, so it looks like we will end officially right now. I want to thank everyone for joining and um, have a great day. We um, can stick around just for a second just to make sure that we've got um, that we can uh, wrap up with the participants. And um, thanks everyone.